Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 155. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co founder of Lend at Fintech. Today's show is sponsored by Lend at Fintech Europe 2018. Europe's leading event for innovation in financial services is coming up on the 19th and 20th of November in London at the Business Design Centre. We have recently opened registration as well as speaker applications. You can find out more by going to lendit.com slash Europe. We have a special guest for you on the show today. I'm delighted to welcome Joanne Barefoot. She is the CEO and founder of Barefoot Innovation Group, and as well as the co-founder of Hummingbird RegTech. She's also been a regulator. She's been in a a consulting practice for many years. She's had a, a, a long career in and around financial services regulation. And so I wanted to get her on the show to talk about where we're at with regulation, what we need to do to improve, and how we can get there. And Joanne gives some concrete examples here about you know, what regulators can do to really bring themselves into the, this rapidly changing world of fintech and really make their, make their regulations a lot more flexible and a lot more easier to comply with. It was a fascinating interview. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Joanne. I am delighted to be here, Peter. Thank you. Okay, well, it's nice to nice to have you, and um, I'm I'm a big fan of your show, and it's one of the ones that I, I I always listen to. So it's nice to nice to have you on the other end of the microphone now. Well, thank you. I am happy to be on the other end of the mic, <sighs> and I am a huge fan of your show, and also, of course, of Lend It. So um, it's really fun to be able to talk. Okay, so let's let's get get started. You've had a a fascinating career. If you go and look at your LinkedIn page, you've, you've done some, some very interesting things, worked for some interesting organizations. Why don't you give us a little bit of, of background about what you've done in your career to date? Sure. So I have worked for decades in and around financial regulation, mostly focused on consumer protection and financial inclusion, although not entirely. And uh, not going all the way back, but my background includes, I worked for the Senate Banking Committee, and then I was Deputy Controller of the Currency. I actually set up the first consumer protection function at the OCC long ago, and I was a partner at KPMG. I was co-chairman of Treeliant Risk Advisors. I've started my own company several times, including one now that I know we're going to talk about, our reg tech company, Hummingbird uh, Reg Tech. And then along the way, I began to immerse in technology five, six years ago and came to the view that technology had the potential to solve a lot of problems that consumers have in their financial lives and small businesses as well that uh, we, we've been trying to solve with regulation without much luck. So I have shifted increasingly to what I call regulation innovation, how to regulate financial innovation and fintech to optimize it, uh, both to let the good things happen and deal with the emerging risks, and then also how to bring reg tech innovation into regulation and compliance to make the whole system work better and more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, want, we want to get into some of that in some, in some depth um, shortly, but I, I want to also talk about your, you, you recently did a stint at Harvard fairly recently. What, what were you doing there and what was, the, what was sort of the focus? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I was a senior fellow for two years in the Harvard Center for Business and Government in the Kennedy School. And it's a fantastic program and gave me the opportunity to spend two years really stepping back and thinking hard and doing research on these issues of consumer. You know that I, I think, you know, I chair the board of the CFSI, the mm-hmm. consumer, the uh, Center for Financial Services Innovation. And we've done so much research there, framing these consumer finance issues in terms of consumer financial health. And so at Harvard, I took a hard look at how we have been, so I've been working on a book 
and it looks at how we currently try to promote consumer financial health from a policy standpoint, clear-eyed assessment of how we're doing. Hint, the answer is not well, Mm -hmm. uh, very poorly. And then then really exploring how fintech could be transformational if we regulate it right. Um, I've, the niche I've carved out for myself in this whole cluster of work has been uh, focusing on the challenge of getting the regulatory response optimized as technology changes finance, digitizes finance. And um, then I also in the book look at reg tech and emerging risks and recommendations. So I haven't finished the book, but I am putting out a series of papers that we're in the process of having reviewed now that'll be an interim product, which I hope people will find really interesting. Mm-hmm. It does sound interesting. So then what, what do you do? What, what does Barefoot Innovation Group do? And you, you, you do sort of private consulting work. Is that what you're doing there? Yeah, we do selected consulting if it's well aligned with the mission that I'm describing. But most of our work is, it's all clustered around these same subjects. And so we do have the podcast show, which has a fantastic uh, listenership around the world. And I must say, fantastic guests, (laughs) as does your show. And so we have that. We have, we do convenings, roundtables, where we really work at gathering people together on a small scale, not like Wendit, but uh, conversational sessions around key issues. And then I do a lot of writing and speaking. I speak all over the world. We have a U.S. focus, but as you well know, these issues are global issues. And in many ways, other parts of the world are further advanced than the United States in both the the fintech innovation and the regulation, Mm -hmm. largely because they all went to cell phone-based financial services more rapidly than we did. And so... They've had to figure that out. So I'm involved with everything from the World Bank and the United Nations. Uh, the Omidyar Network sponsors some of my work. I don't know if your listeners know that Pierre Omidyar was the founder of eBay. Yep. They are committed to financial inclusion and, and have focused on a lot of these same issues. And then, um, yeah, a certain amount of um, consulting. And I work with regulators all over the world and in the U.S. to as they're trying to fashion their innovation strategies and figure out these, you know, build new models. Something I've realized, Peter, is we're not going to restructure what we have, at least not from the top down. We're going to have a certain industry structure and a certain regulatory structure, and we're going to have to create some new models that can enable these old, often entrenched organizations to come together in new ways, collaborate, mm-hmm. uh, figure things out together. So I do a lot of work at those at right. the scenes between all that. Yeah, and I, and I want to dig into some of those new models in just a little bit. But I, I want to firstly, I was listening to your uh, your, your session at Lendit um, just a few weeks ago, and it was really one of the things you said which just really struck me is that you know you, you said that we've made the the underbanks the riskiest segment to lend money to from a regulatory perspective, not from not, not talking yeah. about credit risk. You, you, you were talking about regulatory. So what, what did you mean by that? And and do you think that's going to change anytime soon? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. So the first thing I'll say is this is not anybody's fault. I sometimes find like, find my, I'm always talking about regulatory change and I'm not critical of very much of what has been done in the past. But the thing we need to think about is whether we used to do this right or wrong, the point today is we can do better. And that really applies to this question of lending to people who have been underserved and in a high-risk category, partly because particularly in the United States, we scrutinize these lending patterns for fair lending disparate impact. Mm -hmm. which is, you know, our statistical patterns of outcomes that may show disparities between how different classes of uh, customers have been treated. And the standards for doing that are not clear. Again, I don't think that's anybody's fault, but 
it's a subjective judgment as to whether there's a good business justification for, say, a higher price, uh, high risk loan being more highly correlated with a certain ethnic or racial group, for example. And so the, the lender doesn't know how to defend patterns in that block. And the same with issues of unfair and deceptive acts and practices, UDAP. The regulators worry that the people in this underserved grouping are more vulnerable, and the bank regulators sometimes protect them out of access. They err on the side of making sure that the protection is strong, and so they're going to be tough on any lender that might be doing something that that could be perceived as unfair or discriminatory, even if it's accidental. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then the punishment would be severe, and so the industry minimizes lending in that space, unless, except for the specialists that are in it, like the payday lenders, and uh, they, of course, charge charge a lot for serving it. Right, right. Okay, so I want to I want to move to sort of yeah, compliance, which is something I've heard you talk about a lot, and you you use this term recently, digitally native compliance. And I thought that was a fascinating term. And I wanted you to sort of tell the listeners, you know, what you mean there and what is so significant about it. Yeah. So, you know, we working in the innovation space as we do, I think the thing we all learn is that it's hard to innovate on top of old roots and old systems. Mm -hmm. And it's often easier to start fresh. Much as we think of, I'm not a digital native myself. I'm not in the uh, age bracket for that. And so it's harder for me to learn technology, even though I'm a big technophile, than it is for somebody who grew up taking for granted that your life is about digital technology. I think the big thing that's going on here, and it's sort of obvious, and yet people don't think about it, is we're in the process of digitizing finance. And when you digitize anything, you know, think of your mobile phone, for example, three things always happen. You make the thing better, you make it faster, and you make it cheaper. That's not to say that new problems may not come up, but nevertheless, those three things pretty much always happen when you move a system from an analog design that was originally created on paper and then maybe later was automated. When you put that aside and Start with the data, start with data analytics and machine learning that is building from the data, then everything starts to be better. And even less appreciated than that is that we're also digitizing regulation too. We're in a very early stage of it. It's not obvious to people who are not deep in the space, but the whole regulatory framework and compliance framework is going to be moving to digital tools. So we're going to move toward having complete data sets, real-time data, sophisticated data analytics. To to give a concrete example, the SEC, for instance, is running artificial intelligence on both reported data and external big data to scrutinize the securities markets for potential misconduct or insider trading. Not to prove anything, but to target their resources toward anomalous behavior patterns that are starting to emerge. The whole compliance and regulatory machinery is going to move to that type of thinking and the, and it's going to be driven by data and it's the best of it will be digitally native rather than again, automating old processes. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to get the power out of that. Right, right. Now, could you also just share, I heard you talk about an example at the FCA in the UK that they they have sort of started to, to really implement, I guess, some of this digitally native regulations. Can you tell us a little bit about what, they, what they've done there and the significance? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, has been the most bold and innovative financial regulator in the world. I feel very confident in saying that, although there's some other countries doing really amazing things too. Mm -hmm. And they're famous for their regulatory sandbox, where they have been looking at fintech innovation in a 
control the experimental environment. But maybe to me, even more exciting is that on the heels of that, they've developed a team working on RegTech. And one of the things they have been doing is running tech sprints, which is actually a hackathon. They're a regulator, so they'll tell you they don't like the word hack, but they call it a sprint. And they bring people in for, with regulatory expertise. They bring in the banks and the tech companies and so on, and people who are actually able to write computer code, and they begin to problem solve together in a highly collaborative environment in these sprints. And they ran an experiment last fall that I think is the most revolutionary thing that I've ever heard of in my lifetime in regulation, and that is a test of whether you could issue some regulation in the form of computer code. They call it machine executable regulation. And I, there it is more drama that I, if we had more time, I could sort of tell the full narrative of this, but it was a very ambitious undertaking, a two week effort by a big team of people who by the end of it were exhausted and worried that it wasn't going to work. And they succeeded in taking a block of dummy data and running a regulatory reporting requirement against it and then changing the requirement as if they had issued a change in the regulation and sending that against the data as a block of code and getting a correct report back. And it took 10 seconds to do it. There's video online of this. Wow. Everybody erupted in cheering in the room. <laughs> and I've been saying, when was the last time you saw bankers and regulators cheering together? You know, I mean, it's like unheard of. So they put out a report in February asking for input on where to go from here with this idea. But just in regulatory reporting alone, it has the potential for massive, massive savings to both the government and the industry and part of the vision of it is it would be adopted voluntarily. This is something I've been advocating through my Harvard work, that we shouldn't necessarily force change on the whole system in these experimental areas. We should put out sort of a second channel of regulation and let the industry opt into it voluntarily if they want to. And then maybe over time, the old system will wither away. But the idea is to potentially bring reporting increasingly into this kind of directly connected capability. And then both the regulator and the bank or the financial company would be looking at real-time data, complete data. You know, we still send bank examiners into banks today pulling samples of files mm -hmm. to look at, you know, 40 files to see if there are any problems in them. And then you pull some more. And we do it that way because in the old days, it was the only way to do it. You know, there wasn't data, there wasn't computing power to look at big sets of data and really understand what they're telling us. But now there is. Maybe if we had a system like this, we could have caught the mortgage, the subprime mortgage risk right. early. Right, quite possibly. I mean, particularly if, you, if you've got all the data that's involved in all those mortgages, you could probably, you could probably see what, uh, everyone could have seen what Michael Berry saw, you know, a couple of years before the yeah. financial crisis. So, so I want to move on to a theoretical exercise. So I just want you to imagine if, if Congress has commissioned you to come up with a, with a report to say, right, let's start from scratch. Let's throw out all the financial regulators, FDIC, SEC, um, <laughs> IRA, the whole lot, the whole lot, and just say, how do you, what, what should we, if we were to start this today from scratch, if we were to say, right, the world has changed dramatically and most, a lot of these regulations were written in the 30s or 40s, even earlier in some cases, and that we're still adhering to. What, what should we do? Can you just sort of paint, and obviously it doesn't have to be a completely detailed picture, but just paint some sort of picture for the listeners about what an ideal regulatory regime in this country would look like. Yes, a digitally native regulatory regime. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I won't say everything should go under the OCC, even though I'm an OCC alum <laughs> as a former deputy controller. And I'll also say that I, I, ha I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the ideal regulatory structure because I've been in Washington 
uh, off and on for so long that it's clear to me we can't restructure them. So I'm more interested not in what the agency structure should be, although we should certainly have fewer agencies, than in how can we build new models on top of them. I've been thinking a lot about this lately. We just don't have, we aren't gonna, we can't restructure much of what's there. Any one of these things that you try to restructure, it's gonna take years to do it. And we don't even know in this environment exactly where we're trying to get to. Nobody has all the answers. It's, you know, we're figuring it out as we go. But what these agencies, if I were doing this for Congress, what I would say is these agencies, number one, need to adopt and emphasize their technology and innovation agendas. They all are moving forward on this now. All our U.S. federal agencies and many of the states do have innovation initiatives in various forms. Those should be beefed up. They should be top priority for the heads of these agencies and the senior staff. The skill sets should be changed. These, these agencies need data scientists and engineers, the consumer product design engineers to come in and take a look at these processes. Sometimes when I make my speeches, I show a picture of Congressman Barney Frank, former congressman, and Steve Jobs on the same side. And, you know, both, you know, that's two brilliant minds, a legal mind and a tech mind. But if you gave them the same problem, they wouldn't solve it the same way. Mm -hmm. And we need to be thinking about how can we use technology from scratch to redesign these things. And then I would have all these agencies, I wouldn't just have them do a, another regulatory review, looking for updates and redundancies. I mean, that's all great. I think people should do it. But what you would do instead would be to pick some priority areas and say, we're going to design in one area and then another and another new regulatory approaches from scratch with these digitized tools and and let them grow up next to the old system and let people opt into them and let us learn from doing it. And meanwhile, also, we're going to adopt reg tech ourselves and bring the best of technology into our own processes and encourage the industry to do the same. Mm -hmm. In the United States, as you know, we've got 6,000 banks, for example, and people worry about the future of the community bank in this high tech world. Community banks have two huge problems. One is how to keep up with the technology, and the other is how to not drown in the regulatory work. And technology can solve both of those. We could bring the cost of compliance drastically down if we can allow the adoption of new kinds of, of digital tools for compliance. And the regulators need to get comfortable with that. They need to develop the expertise to be mm. able to do that well. Mm. And they need to collaborate with each other. They need to not have separate turf and domains that have walls around them, but close working groups, robust collaboration among themselves and with the industry and with the tech world, and engage in rapid learning. It's a, it's a, the speed of the learning is half the problem. These regulators are not designed to change this fast. Again, I'm really sympathetic to it. They have the hardest job, it seems to me, because mm. they're supposed to walk the knife edge, you know, get let all the good things happen and let none of the bad things happen, which is impossible. Right. And they can't do that unless they have room to experiment, room for testing, sandboxes, or reg labs where they can get hands on and learn to to regulate through a different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to I want to switch gears to Hummingbird Reg Tech, and I know you guys are. Uh, do you've got a new approach to anti-money laundering but maybe before we talk about that specifically why i mean i, I hear these stats all the time like something like one percent or two percent of all of the laundered money in the world is, is is caught and we have all these complex systems in place for anti for, for aml compliance and it seems like we do we're doing a really bad job why is that yeah it's because the technology is analog era and also is locked up in silos. Mm -hmm. So 
the those numbers are from the United Nations. They've estimated as of about two or three years ago that the global annual financial crime is about $1.6 trillion or more, and that we're catching less than 1% of it currently. And we estimate that in the United States, the price tag for that is probably about $50 billion a year. So we're not failing for lack of resources, at least on the financial industry side, but we're using these old tools. And again, this isn't anybody's fault, but we have to change it. So the system is, as everyone knows, I think that the financial company or bank has to do so-called know your customer screening, verify the identity of customers, and then monitor their activity for suspicious patterns. And if there is a suspicious situation, they have to report that. And at every step of that, we have old technology, high false positives. We're drowning. If you talk with law enforcement agencies, they are drowning in low value information that they have no tools to wade through. There are exceptions in the high, highest priority areas, but the system is, is just putting out a tremendous amount of information that's not useful to anyone. And therefore, law enforcement will tell you that they can't find the biggest crimes. The criminals are getting more and more sophisticated and they are networked. You know, they steal our identities and sell them on the dark web, but then we're still, you know, upset that that a bank is, is missing a field as they fill in the identity information, but the identity information isn't identifying us anymore. You need different data to really prove <laughs> who the person is. You know, mm-hmm. the criminals are more likely than the than the real people to correctly enter the the identity information on the forum because they're doing it with a script instead of a actually typing with their fingers. Right, right. Um, and then it's obviously they're using the latest technology. They got no, there's no, they're unencumbered and they can pay for you know, extremely advanced technology with the best data scientists uh, who are willing to work for a criminal, of course, but they can certainly, they, they, they don't have any, they're not hamstrung. So then what, what, what is Hummingbird doing to try and change this? So Hummingbird is starting with the investigation part of the process, although we'll be doing other things over time and we'll be expanding beyond money laundering over time and I'm money laundering over time as well. But what Hummingbird does is it comes into the the company, bank or financial company, and takes the alerts that have been generated that indicate possible money laundering. It takes all those feeds of information, which are typically very complicated in any financial company can be 20 streams of information internally and externally, for example, uh, puts it all into a single tool, puts all the data together, auto populates the basis of the, uh, the, the form and then runs instant analysis to find the patterns of connections. Are different accounts connected? Are they, are they showing patterns and typologies that suggest illegal activity, whether it's funneling or spoofing or whatever it may be, find those patterns through this robust collection of data and also create data visualizations so that a human being can look at a picture of these patterns. Most people are doing this work, even in the big companies today, in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, they're they're taking information from other sources and copying and pasting it into Excel and then reading it in a spreadsheet. Hummingbird will take all of that, put it into a picture that will show you that's interactive, that you can you can play with and look at different timelines and different focuses. It'll show you a picture that again the human eye can instantly tell whether the pattern is online gambling or might be human trafficking or whatever. Uh, And then also put it on a map instantly. People are looking up Google Maps now and taking screenshots to demonstrate that they did. But this just automatically maps it. 
with dynamic mapping so you can home in on different areas. You can put more data into it and find more patterns. And then at the end of that, either file the suspicious activity report if it is merited or archive it all. The system auto audits everything that's been done so that compliance is automatic. The analyst can show the uh, all the steps that they took, all the things that they looked at and checked. And then over time, as more data comes into it, it gets smarter and smarter. It learns from these human analysts what does money laundering look like in your organization. And then we can use that to begin to analyze the alerts themselves over time and reduce the false positives there. Most of the alert systems today are rules-based rather than machine learning based. So you want to be able to have a tool that starts to suggest to you, here's what the pattern looks like, starts to uh, draft the narrative of the report. It's typically this process per case industry averages somewhere around four hours for a normal case. And a tool, this tool can get that down to 15 minutes or even less of, less if it's a routine case, and then free up resources instead of doing all of this clerical work for actually finding the, the you know, the other 99% of right. the money laundering that we're talking about. Right. Yes, we, 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 we good to do a better job there. That's for sure. It's staggering that we spend all that money for such a small return on investment when it comes to catching these people. So The other thing that we always try to emphasize is the importance of the of getting this right, because it's not just the task that we're talking about. You're talking about the funding mechanisms for illegal drugs, the opioid ex- epidemic, terrorism, human trafficking, illegal wildlife tra- trafficking, all the way down the line. There's so little risk to these criminals, including the, these sophisticated international networks, so little risk of getting caught which is what makes this so lucrative. And and if you talk to the law enforcement people working with these tools, they are so eager. We've I've seen for with my own eyes the um, situations where they're sitting around tables, printouts and yellow highlighters, trying to find patterns. And you know we really have to do better than that. Yeah, I mean that's and that's exactly what you know the technology is designed to do is to find patterns where humans find it difficult. So uh, that, that, that does sound promising. So we're almost out of time, but one thing I, I wanted to ask before you go is that when, when I hear you speak and on your podcast and other, other times, you always seem optimistic about the, the future for, you know, for financial regulation, for compliance. And, I'm, and I, I, I'd love to share your optimism, but I, I sometimes feel the opposite to that. That, that we have, we've got 50 states with all different uh, priorities. We've got all different regulatory agencies with different priorities. And so I guess the last question is, why, why are you optimistic uh, about the future? That's such a great question. I am very, very optimistic. I don't underestimate the difficulty. I work for the United States Senate. You know, I'm not naive about right. <laughs> things changing. But I'm absolutely sure we're going to go in the right direction. One reason is I see the policymakers and regulators changing every day. There is more openness, more innovation, more eagerness to learn and think differently in regulators in the United States and around the world. They are they're beginning to lead. And secondly, they don't have the choice not to. I think it's becoming increasing, increasingly clear to both to regulators and to compliance people that as technology changes the world we're in, you, you don't have the option of holding still until it becomes more clear to you what to do. It's not going to get clear. Right. We're going to be in permanent uncertainty. And the delta between the linear systems that we've been using and the exponential curve of the technology change is just widening constantly so that the risk increasingly is in not changing instead of clinging to 
your comfort zone of what you used to do. And I think regulators can see that we're going to have failures in banks and in regulators for not adopting these different tools. But tools are just better. And here's the last thing I'll say. We think of regulation as a binary choice because it always has been. You either have to spend a lot of money to get a good outcome or you try to spend less money and you're compromising on results. This technology breaks that dynamic and everybody can have what they want. We can have less expensive and better regulation and compliance at the same time if we adopt these changes. And if the, once people realize that, they want to make it happen. The UK Financial Conduct Authority RegCheck group has seven people in it, and they have hundreds of people helping them build new tools because people can see there's a growing community of people who can see that we can do this better if we work together. Mm -hmm. well, totally I absolutely. I, ho I hope you're right. I, I do. And uh, I really, I really appreciate you coming to the show today, Joanne. There's much more to talk about, but we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for having me. And I am inviting you back on to my show as well. <laughs> and I'll look forward to another conversation okay. there. That Thank you, Peter. Like it's really been fun. Thanks, Joanne. See ya. Yeah. You know, on this show, I, I tend to focus on the commercial side of finance and fintech. I, I don't spend a whole lot of time on the regulatory piece, but it is such an important piece. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to get Joanne on today. And, you know, it really, it really strikes me that we are always pushing the envelope on, with technology when it comes to whether it's data science, whether it's mobile technology, you know, whether it's just bringing in the latest, you know, fastest hardware. All of this is available to regulators as well. And I love the example she gave about the UK where they really, you know, you can really have machines really manage the compliance process and the regulatory process. So I think we are, we are a long way away from having that be a reality in this country in a widespread way, but it clearly points to where the future will go and I think where it has to go. As Joanne says, it's like we really don't have a choice anymore because the world is changing so fast and regulators have to try as best they can to change with it. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Today's show was sponsored by Lendit Fintech Europe 2018, Europe's leading event for innovation in financial services. It's happening November 19th and 20th at the Business Design Centre in London. Registration is now open as well as speaker applications. Find out more by going to lendit.com slash Europe.